Welcome to Simplify Your Retirement with Certified Financial Planner Stephen Strickland from Wise Wealth LLC. In this podcast, we help individuals and couples plan for a peaceful and enjoyable retirement. Join us on this journey where we explore the importance of simplifying the retirement planning process as Stephen, with his years of experience and expertise in retirement income planning, along with guest experts, will help you achieve first wisdom, then wealth. And don't forget to check out the Simplify Your Retirement online course and other great resources at SimplifyYourRetirement.com. Now, on to the show. Hello, and welcome to Simplify Your Retirement with Stephen Strickland from Wise Wealth. Hey, we're excited to have you on the show today, Stephen, and we look forward to the guests that you have invited to today's podcast as well. Absolutely. Been looking forward to it. You know, season four um, has been interesting so far. We've had some great guests, uh, some people that bring some uh, perspectives in uh, some topics that we don't always talk about in terms of traditional financial planning, traditional retirement planning. And so I'm looking forward to uh, talking with our guests today. Yeah, absolutely. And I know uh, the topic that we have for today uh, will be interesting to a lot of people, I think, because even as I drive around town, I hear this concept pop up. And so I'm curious about it as well. Absolutely. And so uh, the, our guest for today's podcast is Mark Willis. Mark uh, is a certified financial planner. He is the owner of Late Growth Financial Services in Chicago, and he specializes in building custom tailored financial strategies. Uh, some of them are, they're not necessarily mainstream. I'm sure, Mark, mm-hmm. you, you do some <laughs> things that are mainstream and some things that are not mainstream, and um, and that's good. Mark uh, is also the co-host of a podcast himself called Not Your Average Financial Podcast. You can catch that one at nyafinancialpodcast.com. And um, Mark, we're glad to have you on the on the show with us today. Hey, thanks, guys. Glad to be on. Appreciate that. Um, you know, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is actually, you know, a couple of things that I think well, Paul just alluded to one of them uh, just a moment ago. We're going to get to that one, which is the main topic for the podcast today. But even before we get into that, I found your story interesting because uh, I read that you graduated from uh, college with uh, six figures of student loan debt. So I'm sure you're not alone. I'm sure there's a lot of people yep. in our audience who can relate to that. But you discovered a way to turn that debt into real wealth. And you even got you know into this industry because of what happened in 2008 when everyone lost their home equity and retirement savings went down uh, to the collapse in the stock market. And so it really seemed like this was a catalyst for you to even get into the industry. You want to tell us a little bit of that story? It was a attraction and repulsion at the same time. When I got <laughs> into the financial world, it was sort of like the house of cards was all coming down. In fact, I sort of liken it to being dropped into the front lines of a war. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I was just getting into the financial universe, it was in the aftermath of 2008 and nine. And I was working for a CPA, mm-hmm. and her job was to to call and talk to clients. My job was to basically gather tax documents and prepare everything for her. Mm-hmm. But it was overwhelming when I would hear her phone calls. Some of those calls would be with 61-year-old, 62-year-old, you know, pre-retirees. And she would say to them, I'm sorry, Mr. Client, but you can't retire mm-hmm. like we thought you could. I just lost you half of your money. Half. Right. Half. Half your life gone financial hard work gone. Right. And that just was a jaw dropper to me. And it almost made me leave the business, to be mm-hmm. honest with you. Uh, and coupled with that was, you know, I couldn't leave really because I was forced to stay there. <laughs> Why? Because I had a major student loan payment. I, I jokingly say I married two women in college, my yeah. beautiful wife and Sally May. Sally May. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> So I had that monthly payment. I couldn't leave the job. Yeah, she's lived in a lot of our houses. Exactly. She makes her way around. I know that. Yeah, that's right. She and she wants a payment every month. Yes. You know, so I had to keep working, and uh, you know, it was a big payment. It mm-hmm. felt like a mortgage payment. Right. Um. And anyway, we were working that out, and but what we didn't know is we didn't know what to do. I just didn't have any financial plan. You know, like most people, we listen to to people on the radio, and we listen to you know read this book or hear it or heard somebody tell us this at the water cooler, sort of speak. Right. But we had no real aims, no vision, no purpose for money. Mm -hmm. And part of our journey was just discovering what do we truly want? What Mm -hmm. do we truly want? Which is a great starting question, in in my opinion, to finally sit down. I know people who've gone their entire financial lives and never said, what do I want my money to do for me? Right. That's a great question. If folks get nothing else out of this episode. Right. Spend five, 10 minutes journaling. What do you truly want? Exactly. And uh, nothing like uh, the you know financial collapse 2008 uh, to make people 
you know, really take a step back and, and think about that. It's interesting, as you were saying that, I was reminded uh, myself uh, that we just actually uh, celebrated our 15th anniversary as a firm. Wise Wealth was started in 2007. Mm. So I started this firm in 2007, mm. right before that collapse. So congratulations. Yeah, it's, it was amazing just to, to go through that time almost, you know, right away um, in that. But like you said, um, you realize that a lot of people at that time, because, you know, I, I would look at it and I'm sure you look at it the same way that it's basically due to a lack of planning. Uh, you know, they were not prepared for a potential stock market decline. They didn't have their assets allocated in such a way. They weren't thinking the, the right way to be able to retire because of what happened in the stock market. But uh, as you know, and I know, I'm sure there's ways to prepare for that. So uh, another stock market collapse doesn't derail someone's retirement. Now, uh, we're sitting here today, the stock yeah. market's you know still at an all-time high. And, and I know one of the biggest risks that people take is you know, this mindset of I'm in an accumulation phase of investing. I'm going to go directly to a distribution phase. I'm not really going to change the allocations. And, and there's a major risk there. What do you think? Yeah. Well, sure. Yeah. And and to, to your point, uh, it's sort of like when you climb up a mountain, you use a different set of muscles than when you're coming back down. In fact, National Geographic ran a couple of articles a year or two ago talking about how 85% of deaths are coming down Mount Everest. Interesting. Coming down. Yep. Coming down. Now, how you, you guys are in the financial world. You can already tie these two dots together, but let me spell it out. You know, when you're climbing up Mount Retirement, you're ascending the mountain. You're saving that money that you didn't need to spend on groceries. You're, it's easy to climb the mountain because you're not having to spend that money. And when the market crashes and you're you know, 42 years old and, and you're, you don't have to really watch that 401k, do you? Right. But it's when you're 62 or 82 what are you going to do yeah. when you're 82 right. and the market's crashing? Because it's not like the market asks you first. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> it just does what it's going to do. Yeah. So when you're sucking money out of your 401k for groceries and grandkids and the market's sucking money out of your 401k too, that's a double pain, isn't it? And yeah. you can quickly run out of cash, as you guys know. Absolutely. And, I, and I've always liked that analogy. It's like, uh, at least when you're climbing up, you can actually see the goal. The goal is in sight. Uh, you you know what you're trying to get mm. to. It's where you're coming down. Uh, you don't know where the end is. And it's like even with retirement, that's the problem with, you know, the distribution phase or the, or the fun part of retirement should be enjoying it. Everything you say to work for, but there is no finish line. No one knows where that is and when that is. And that creates challenges too. Uh, that we believe that planning can help with, that is for sure. So you you graduated from yep. college, you have this job, you're you're getting a you're getting a real education in the world of finances because you're working at a, fir a CPA firm while people are uh, while the stock market's collapsing. But then you also mentioned you have to stay there in an environment because you have you have student loans you're dealing with. So what did you do about the student loans? How did you get out of debt? And uh, what is this idea of even buying back debt? Yeah, well, you know there was. There was lots of people on the radio telling me to snowball my debt. Uh, their, you know, and, and their strategies and tools at least got me focused on my money. I got to say that about the gurus on the radio, uh, who I guess we we'll, we'll just say the last name rhymes with Samsey. Uh, and uh, and so I had a, a long history with uh, with that and was big big fan yeah. uh, of that for mm -hmm. a long time. And it helped pay down some of my debt. But what I realized halfway through that project of paying off all that student loan debt was I was literally forfeiting the most valuable dollars of my entire life. Yeah. Think about that. When you're 22, 23, 24, and you're throwing money into a hole, you'll never see that money earn interest for you ever again, right? And that's really the most valuable dollars that you'll ever have. The younger you are, the more right. valuable your money is due to compound growth opportunity cost, right? Right. So it was, it was in that moment that some good friends and a former professor from my college came and sat down with me and said, Mark, is there something better than just being debt-free? Hmm. Is there anything possibly better? Could you possibly be better than debt-free? Yeah. And it got me thinking, you know, if I just spend my life, the next, I was going to, it was aimed for about four more years of debt payoff. That was the goal. Okay. Four years. Right. Of slavery. Amazing. And then I'd be what? I'd be four years older yep. and I'd be at the starting line of my financial life. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I had all this money, all this, this trouble in my past and I was having to, you know, come to terms and pay off all this debt. And the question was, is there something better than just, you know, climbing out of this hole? Could mm -hmm. I possibly find a way in, in jujitsu and other forms of martial <laughs> arts, sometimes they'll actually 
they'll actually take the problem and make it part of the, they'll leverage the problem into the solution. So mm -hmm. when you have uh, an attacker coming at you, can you somehow use their weight and their right. power against them? Yeah. You know, not just turn your problem into a solution. So a momentum. yeah, that's part of what we wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah. On a mental level and a financial level, yeah. is there a way I can turn my debt liability into an asset? Okay. And that's what we found with uh, a tool we, we heard was called bank on yourself. Okay. And so that's kind of become part of our, our calling card for our business. Absolutely. And then this is exactly what uh, Paul had alluded to at the beginning of the podcast. It's something that a lot of times, you know, people, we hear this on the radio sometimes, or maybe people talking about it. And uh, we hear about it at different places. And so this is something that I really wanted to make our audience aware of what this is all about. And I know this is something that you specialize in. So that's why we we're really excited to have you on the podcast today just to clear this up. I think people need to understand what it is. Our philosophy at our firm Wise Wealth is that there is no such thing as a bad product, only a bad fit. And so we think it's important to understand all the different investment options that are out there, the different products that are available, so you can make a good decision, whether it's the right fit for you or whether it's not. And so um, that's why you know we're excited to talk to you about this concept of banking on yourself. And, and I know uh, you this concept allows you to, like you said, pay off debt and be something better than debt-free. Uh, I know this concept um, you know allows you know a person to basically eliminate one of the biggest risks that people face going into retirement. And that is, is taxes. And we also know that, uh, you know, there are very few tax free in, you know, income tax free options available to anybody And this is one of them. And so, uh, we'd love for you to tell us about banking on yourself. How does it work? Why does it work? And uh, we'll look forward to hearing about it. Well, yeah, that's that's a, that's a big question. So you stop me if I go too far, <laughs> no. too far afield, okay? Okay, yep. Uh, because, yeah, I'll start with my story. So we found a, a little-known form of dividend-paying whole life insurance solved our problem. Hmm. And this is a big shocker for me. Again, as a, a fan of, of a certain radio host it, mm, it, right. who hates whole life insurance, yes. uh, anything besides term insurance, right? Uh, so l let me kind of do a quick education primer here. There's two types of life insurance, generally speaking. There's rented and owned. And term insurance is rented insurance. And there's nothing wrong with renting, right? There's a right. certain reason to rent an apartment. There's a certain reason to own a house. Both are valid. So term insurance is sort of like renting a house. You own nothing. You're borrowing that death benefit for a certain term, a period of time. And the landlord can raise the rent on you over time as you age. Uh -huh. So just like that, owning a house, you have a fixed amount you're putting into that house called a mortgage, and you can build up equity on that house. And that mortgage payment does not go up with inflation, and it does not increase like it would with term insurance, mm -hmm. uh, generally speaking. So these are all, all sort of parallels to the whole life insurance conversation. So the, right. the bank on yourself concept is using that tool of whole life insurance to then build an asset called cash value. Mm -hmm. And there is life insurance involved, which is income tax-free to my heirs, my family. Um, but on this side of the grass, it's a lot more fun to spend money on this side of the grass, guys. I'll just be honest with you. <laughs> so I'm more concerned today on what can this cash value, this equity in the policy do for me. Mm -hmm. And when I was in my late 20s, I was very concerned with how am I going to use this stodgy old asset called life insurance, right. cash value life insurance to then pay off my debt. What's, what do these two things have in common? What can they do for me? Mm -hmm. Here's how it worked for me. Okay. I built, I still paid all my debts. So step one of what we now call the debt snow bank method. Okay. Not the debt snowball method, yep. but the debt snow bank method. Okay. <laughs> what yep. we do is uh, we simply continue to pay our minimum payments on all of our debts. Don't go behind on your debt, of course. But everything additional that we didn't need to spend on minimum debt payments and that we didn't need to spend on groceries, et cetera, we flooded into a whole life policy. Okay. And we did that because it built up significant cash value. This is not the same kind of whole life that is riddled with commissions and so forth. We mm -hmm. trim down those commissions as, as hard as we can, somewhere around 70 to 80% commission cuts mm -hmm. to design the policies for cash value accumulation. Right. And as you build up all that cash, that's again, that's liquid money. I can access that money with no pro prohibition mm -hmm. and no tax for any purpose. I could go to Disney World with it or I could, in my case, pay off my student loans. Right. And now, why is this any better than just saving up in a savings account? 
I'll say this and then I'll hush and get your thoughts here. <laughs> but when you have a whole life policy that's got a non-direct recognition loan, that's a big mouthful there. Right. Um, but when you've got that specific type of loan, you can borrow against your life insurance cash value and it will continue to grow as if you hadn't touched a dime of the money. Right. So I'll say that again. Mm -hmm. If I've got 10 grand in cash value and I borrow out 7,000 to pay off a student loan or whatever, my policy is still earning interest and dividends on the entire $10,000 as if I hadn't touched that cash. Right. To me, that's buying back my debt. Now I'm better than debt free because I still have that $10,000 asset earning for me. And now I'm in control of repaying myself. It's right. a policy loan that I pay off on my own terms. Gotcha. No, very interesting. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's a great way to look at it. You know, we look at uh, temporary and permanent insurance. I, I like the uh, the analogy of rented versus owned. I think that's going to be extremely helpful, really, for people to think through. Um, you know, what type of insurance do you own, and why do you own it? And uh, so, even with the the snow bank method. Um, you know, the minimum payments on the debt and you make the rest of them. So obviously when you buy a policy, there is some medical underwriting. That's always one thing that goes into it. Mm-hmm. Even with these policies, just some medical underwriting. And then there's always going to be, I, I guess you want to talk, talk a little bit about uh, maybe some, you know, limits. We know there's no income limits, which is nice. You know, for, we know when people do a Roth IRA, there's income limits uh, to, to be able to contribute to a Roth. We know there's contribution limits, in a Roth IRA, which is the the other type of investment that's tax free, so I always like to compare mm-hmm. uh, this sort of strategy with a Roth IRA. And uh, obviously, in the Roth, there's income limits and contribution limits. I know there's n- there's no such limits per se in a in a life insurance policy like this. But what are the limits? I mean, is it flexible or is it you know when you buy the policy, is there kind of like a a maximum amount? You you mentioned the pay off the you know pay the minimum payments on debt and put the rest in here, you know, what are, how do you describe those kind of limits that you can, how much can you add to the policy? Well, let's talk about the downsides. Then I want to really emphasize the name of your show, simplify your retirement. Mm -hmm. You know, I was thinking about the title of your podcast before and your show before I came on here. Mm -hmm. And it made me think of a question I heard Tim Ferriss, another podcaster Mm -hmm. ask one time in in his book, tribe of mentors. And the, the question is, what would it be like if it were easy? Right. What would it be like if it were easy? Yep. And I apply that immediately to money. Yeah. You think about how most people live their financial life. It's nothing but, e- it, if anything, it's it would be defined as anything but easy, right? Right. People live their financial life with a bag, bag full of rocks on their back. Uh, yep. You know, they grabbed this Roth IRA when they were a kid, and they grabbed this 401k when they got their first job, and mm-hmm. they got this credit card when they became an adult, and they got all these student loans they got to pay off, and they right. got this thing with... They don't even know why they have a wealth front account, you know, whatever right. it is, you know, um, <laughs> yeah. list, list your 15 different accounts and no one knows why they have this big bag of rocks on their back. Right. Uh, that's anything but easy. So yeah. what would it be like if it were easy? It would have no contribution limits. It would have no income phase outs. It would not be taxed in the future. You'd always have access to the money. You could use it for anything. I could send, you know, for Disney World or, or debt payoff or real estate investing or, or stock investing or anything else you might want to use it for. And no one's going to tell you no. You've always got access to cash. You can always use it to leverage to leave your family more than you could ever save for them. Yeah. Think about that for a minute. Yep. I'll always leave my family more than I'll save for them in the life insurance policy because it's life insurance. Right. So what would it be like if you didn't have to guess and pick stocks? What would it be like if you didn't have to, you know, choose... Yeah. Between, you know, groceries and grandkids in retirement. Right. You know, when you have one of these, these policies or even a couple of them, yeah. does it take away options or does it give you more options? Right. So when you, when you've got the policy in your, you have the, you have the one part of the payments obviously going to pay for that death benefit life insurance, the other amount that you're putting into it, mm-hmm. it's growing. So you mentioned, you know, uh, you're not worried about, you know, the stock market with that sort of stuff. So when we're talking about banking on yourself, we're still talking about a, uh, an insurance product though, that is principal guaranteed. So the money, I guess that goes in there, how am I earning interest? How am I earning money? And you mentioned something before that I want to make sure uh, everybody does understand. And that is this whole idea where you've got this, uh, where you've got $10,000 and you pull out seven, uh, but it's not like you're left with three. You still have $10,000 in there potentially growing for you. 
and you're just going to pay back the loan or the death benefit's going to pay back the loan, which one I, I want to come back to. But how is that ten thousand dollars? How is that extra money that's in that policy continuing to grow? Yeah, well, and, and is it principal guaranteed? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the the insurance company is the the one offering the guarantee, not not me, not anybody else. Right. You know, it's the one hundred year old plus mm-hmm. financial institution that's made good on their promises through thick and thin. I mean, guys, they've been through multiple pandemics. That's right. how old these companies are. Yep. And you want to work with companies that have made it through these sort of ups and downs because you want to know that they're going to be there for your your lifetime and your children's lifetime. That's that's important to me to, to mention that. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, the insurance company is bearing the brunt of risk. You know, think about the basic definition of insurance. It's the transfer of risk from me yeah. or you to an insurance company, that's right. whether it's health insurance or, you know, property and casualty. Yep. So- you know, there's downsides to this. You want to really be aware that it, it does cost something to buy a life insurance policy. Mm-hmm. For example, in that example I gave you there, ten thousand dollar cash value, you might have put in fourteen grand that yeah. into that policy so far, depending. Right. Um, in the first year, for example, you're going to end up with somewhere between sixty-five and eighty percent of your contribution. Okay. Ouch. So we lost some purchasing power in that first year. Mm-hmm. Yep. For example, my story, it probably took me an extra year to pay off all my student loans to do it the way I did it. Okay. Now, why, in the, why in the heck would I do that? Well, it's because I wanted a massive asset on, a, on my balance sheet when I was mm-hmm. done with this job of paying mm-hmm. off all my debt. I didn't want to just be back to net zero, climbing back up the, the debtor's staircase only to fall back down again when it was time to buy my car or my mortgage. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wanted something that I could begin to earn interest for me and never stop ever again. Right. Um, and and it's just a great coupler. And, and we should talk about this before we wrap up some point. Yeah. Um, I, I like to use the whole life as a buffer asset with my stocks and bonds and, and mutual funds, index funds, anything else. Good. There's some incredible research out there on how you can use the whole life policy coupled with your investing portfolio mm-hmm. to actually increase how much retirement income clients can take by a factor of sometimes three or four. Yep. I agree. And I appreciate your honesty and transparency there. So we know that so a couple of things that people need to be aware of is, you know, it may take, this is not a short-term strategy. When you, when you buy this, this is not right. something you do and you, you sell it next year or two years from now, you need to go into this thing. And this is a long-term approach. This is a long-term plan. And then the longer t- time you own it and have it, the, the better the outcomes, obviously. That's right. Yeah. Well, imagine why do any of us take an airplane? Yeah versus a car. You know, when I'm going to a grocery store, I'm going to drive my car. No, mm-hmm. no questions asked. It's much more efficient than flying my airplane, mm-hmm. which I don't have. I don't own an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> I would drive my car to the grocery store. But if I'm going to go to, yeah. from Kansas City to LA, mm-hmm. California, I'm going to take an airplane. Right. Um, why? Because it's way more efficient. Mm-hmm. Same with whole life insurance. You want right. to take it for the long distance. Yep. It's not a get in, get out for sure. Gotcha. So then you've got this. I mean, so you're, you're, you're basically saying at different points in times, like I could take the money out. Um, I could just, you know, take my cash and take it out. I could actually take a loan where it, I, I can either pay back this loan, I guess, on my own if I want to at any point in time or um, future cash payments and go towards the interest or even the death benefit. I guess if there's any loan left when I die, the death benefit would pay off that loan and the, the remaining balance would go to our beneficiaries. We just want to talk about a little bit about how does this loan get repaid? Well, I'll tell the, I'll, I'll do it with a story and that's a great question. Um, because yes, when you borrow against these policies, it is a loan, Mm -hmm. but it's not like a loan at a bank. Mm -hmm. They do not require that I repay this loan. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, it's a loan on their books. And if I never pay off the loan, it would be reduced by, by my death benefit. But as I did repay my loan to my policy back in the day, when I did this for my student loans, it all became liquid and accessible to me again. Mm -hmm. So what, what have I used the policy for since I've recycled that money to use it for cars. We went on a, uh, Mm we bought several cars with our policies. We've gone on a month long vacation to Hawaii. Why -hmm. would I do that? Well, I was going to go on vacation anyway. So why not use the policy and have a no guilt vacation, right? Because the policy is still earning interest for me. Mm -hmm. Uh, Even while I'm on the sands of Hawaii, Hawaii, uh, we've used it to invest in our business. We've used it to invest in stock and invest in real estate syndication deals. So there's some incredible opportunity. And yeah. Right. And so I just want to jump in here and, and say to, to the audience, obviously uh, you can probably tell, you know, by Mark's voice that uh, we're talking about someone who's under age 59 and a half. 
Right. Whereas most people, you know, I mean, all the money we save for retirement and all these things is pretty much locked up until, you know, 59 and a half at the earliest without any penalties. And so it gives somebody options for money that they can get to even be before 59 and a half and have to worry about penalties. That's right. Yeah. You know, you're, you're exactly right. That, and that's an oddly specific age, in my opinion. I'm, yeah. you know, Congress makes the rules. We don't, but yeah. <laughs> 59 and a half um, is, is the, it's sort of like when the, the money comes out of jail, I guess. I don't know. Right. It's like, uh, they finally at least changed the RMD age of 72 instead of 70 and a half. They made that somebody finally made sense there. It's an, it's an even number. It makes sense. So maybe they'll do it one of these days with this, but uh but very interesting, the banking on yourself concept. Our guest is Mark Willis. He is the co-host of Not Your Average Financial Podcast, NYA Financial Podcast.com, financial advisor from Chicago. This is uh, very fascinating um, because, again, uh, we want our, our clients, we want our audience to know about this, you know, how it works, how it works. So would you say, I guess I want to ask you a question about, you know, fit. We talked about this a little bit earlier um, you know, one thing I want to say, I want to emphasize what you just said, and that is, it's just like everything else. Uh, sometimes people hear about, let's say, a, an annuity, or they hear about a, a stock, or they hear about a mutual fund, and they hear about banking on yourself. So all of a sudden, somebody says, all right, that's it. I'm going to, everything needs to go there. <laughs> I don't need to do anything else. You mentioned a second ago, this is a great buffer asset, even. It doesn't mean you should get rid of real estate you own or stocks that you own or mutual funds you own and do all this. This is just something else that could come in. It can reduce risk. It can re it can increase retirement income options. These are the things that we've talked about already. So I guess the first thing is, you know, it's not, it's not a situation where you would say it's all you should, this is the only thing someone should do. No, definitely not. Um, you know, there's, there's a world of financial universe out there. I view personally, now this is me personally, not for every client, of course, but I personally view my whole life policies as the garage for my money. And just like my cars live in my garage, they don't stay there. Mm -hmm. uh, I would hate to have my cars just living there to rust out for my car's lifetime. Mm -hmm. No, I take my car out of my garage and I go do a business deal yeah. or I go on a vacation mm -hmm. or I do something that, that is, uh, you know, both gotcha. if I can do it for the write off, you know, yep. and always yeah. though, always my cars come right back to my garage. That's where they gotcha. reside. Hmm. And you know, that's similar to that's how I view my policies and the cash in my policies. The money comes out of my policy for personal reasons. Yep. The money comes out of my policies for my daughter's college. It comes hmm. out of my policies for business investment or real estate or, or other, yeah. you know, private right. investment deals, whatever. Right, uh, but it always comes back to my policies, and I, gotcha. I view it such as that. Now, right. you brought up the the volatility buffer concept, and mm -hmm. I've actually got some numbers here um, that we could go through. I hate yeah. doing numbers on right. <laughs> on uh, the radio or podcast, but yeah. um, it it really does provide yeah. much more security if you've got a large invested asset portfolio mm -hmm. um, to provide you some sort of buffer for when those market crashes do come. Right what do you have as a buffer? Right. And I'd be happy to talk through that as a real life example from a client. If you, if you think that would be helpful. Sure. And I think the, you know, the main thing is like you're saying is because a lot of people will have two types of assets. You know, someone has a 401k, they've got a company match and it's a hundred percent return on that. And you'd say, you know, Hey, do that. So you have some money, obviously probably everyone's gonna have money in the stock market because of that. But this is another alternative uh, type of investment that you can get that, you know, takes your overall risk and lowers it. Because now you're dealing with something that's principal guaranteed. Yeah, if you've got something that has uh, that you can share with us, I'd be glad to hear it. I'll try to keep it simple for folks driving down the yes. road here. But let's say you're a 65-year-old and you've been successful working with Paul and Stephen, and you've got a $2 million IRA balance, mm -hmm. you know, broadly diversified across the, the different market indices, et cetera, $2 million. And you are ready to retire at age 65, so you start taking 150 grand a year out of that IRA. Mm -hmm. And the market does what it's going to do, and there's some – early negative years, right. unfortunately, and due to your also taking withdrawals, yeah. without any buffer asset, you'd be at age 80 with half of your money left, mm -hmm. $941,000 at age 80, just 15 years later. Mm -hmm. Yikes. Right. Now, when you're 80 and you're as healthy as a horse, yep. you might be kind of concerned that you've already spent half your money. Right. What could you do on the alternative? Well, if you had maybe set up a buffer asset called a whole life policy or some sort of a cash value life insurance policy mm -hmm. in the years that there are dramatic downturns, don't take from the invested pool of money, yep. but rather pull from the whole life cash value. You might only need four to six years of, 
of living expenses and cash value mm -hmm. to to help you survive during those downturn years. You yeah. might have two to three major market crashes during your retirement. Mm -hmm. They seem to come every 10 years or so. Right. So if you had a four to six years of living expenses and cash value, you could borrow slash withdraw from your cash value and survive those years, let the market rebound mm -hmm. like it usually does. And that IRA balance would be in, in my math here, mm -hmm. not 941 grand after 15 years, but three, Point eight million dollars mm -hmm. right. is the end balance after 15 years. Yeah. Now that's dramatic. That is dramatic. That's a big difference. You can either spend that or you can give it to the kids. Right. Exactly. Well, I think that's excellent um, analogy and example. Actually, you know what I mean? Real life example as far as how that would work, having different assets that you can pull from based on the marketing conditions at that time. And that's why really, you know, ultimately it's not putting all your eggs, being diversified when it comes to your investments, but also your income uh, strategies and distribution strategies and, uh, and even tax, uh, you know, different, ta you know, tax uh, differences between the way the money comes out. So there's a lot of different ways to look at this and, and having an asset like this, which again, ultimately is, is, is an alternative. Like you said, it's not your, it's not your average financial podcast. It's not your average financial product. A lot of, you know, traditional uh, stockbrokers, a lot of traditional financial advisors are not going to mention it. They're not going to talk about it. Uh, because it takes away from maybe market types of investments. And that's where you're a certified financial planner. I am too. We want to make sure our clients are aware of all the different types of products that are available to be completely objective and find out when it's a good fit. You know, they're not every single investment is the right fit for every single person at every single time. That's right. Uh, there are certain times where it fits and certain times that it's not. And that's why it's important though to be, you know, open-minded. You know, I think one of the biggest mistakes people make is they just tend to yep, close their mind about whatever because they've heard, you know, different things or, or because some people who promote certain things that, that we know, uh, you know, the way they do it and it's like this or nothing, you know what I mean? It turns people off and so, therefore they take the entire product or the entire concept and say, yep, forget that because one person gave me a bad taste about it, you know, mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. you know, someone who had it and didn't understand it. So this has been extremely helpful, Mark. And I, well said. And I know we're kind of, uh, we're, doing, uh, we're a couple of minutes over here, but is there anything else that you would like to say in closing before we close out the podcast today? Well, someone once asked me, Mark, if you had the choice could you and you could choose, would you rather have Tiger Woods golf clubs or Tiger Woods golf swing? Mm -hmm. And I'd always choose the swing. Mm -hmm. I want that swing. Yep. I can buy my clubs anywhere and the clubs can be interchangeable. And as you said, there's no perfect uh, solution yep. for every person out there. Yep. But if we could, if we could learn the swing, if we could learn how to think about money, mm -hmm. everything else becomes easier. But you know, there's an old quote uh, it says that 10% uh, of people think mm -hmm. another 10% of people think that they think, and the rest of us would rather die than think. <laughs> so my hope is right. because we're all listening, because everyone here is listening to this podcast, yes. they're wanting to think, and that's incredibly valuable. That that four pound knot of neurons in your head, mm -hmm. guys, it can change your life. It can change your family tree. Mm -hmm. But we got to apply those those neurons, and, and that's the hardest part for me, anyway. So um, I appreciate you guys for the good work you do. Yep, letting folks learn about money. Yep, definitely. I appreciate that. You know, you just mentioned too. It's not just about even what you learn; it's about what you do with what you learn. We're big believers in uh, education and the difference between knowledge and wisdom. We want people to have. Wisdom. Mm -hmm. Actually, we want them to take more than just learning something new and actually, you know, figure out how it applies to your life. So thank you, Mark, very much. Uh, this is Mark Willis, is our guest. He's the uh, co-host of the Not Your Average Financial Podcast. You can find that and listen to more concepts just like this. And we appreciate uh, Mark being on the podcast today, Paul. Uh, Paul, one of the things that uh, Mark mentioned that uh, that I think is very intriguing and something mm -hmm. that I'm going to be thinking about is in, in, is this concept of what would it look like if it was easy? Yeah. And, you know, it, it really is. I mean, and I appreciate Mark, you saying you mentioning that because that is, that's, that's how we do business. Simplify your retirement. And we try to make it as simple as possible. We use a three bucket approach. We take all these things and yeah, there may be complicated scenarios in there, but the, the, the plan itself should be simple. And, and this concept that Mark was talking about today is, is simple. It doesn't have to be complicated. No. And uh, simplicity is the new sophistication. That's why we're doing this <laughs> podcast. That's why we've got the book, the course, and everything else. So Yeah, yeah. I was sitting there thinking, too, I need a bigger garage. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. So thank you, Stephen. Uh, thank you, Mark. Appreciate having you on. And uh, 
you know, the stories help help people understand complex subjects as well. And so certainly appreciate that. And of course, our last thank you goes to you, the listening audience. You're the reason we do this and we wouldn't be here without you. Thank you for tuning in to Simplify Your Retirement Podcast with Steven Strickland. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Steven comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. And it makes it much easier to share with your family and friends. Again, thank you for listening today. For everyone at Wise Wealth, this is Paul Brock reminding you that financial peace comes from having a plan. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Simplify Your Retirement podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Wise Wealth LLC or Simplify Your Retirement. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of a financial advisor or other qualified financial professionals with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.